Hello and welcome to a very special edition of Electoral Dysfunction with me, Beth Rigby, in Berlin. And me, Ruth Davidson, in Scotland. Now, I feel like every week we tell you we have some big news, but today it is mega because we are joined by our brand new permanent co-host. Now, we are also going to have a debrief on Keir Starmer's first big down in street speech and his trip to Europe. I have returned from my holidays especially to cover this and we'll also tell you what to watch out for in the new political term. But first, our big news. So can I have a drum roll please, Ruth? You're so good at that. (laughs) It is, of course, our new permanent podcast host, who could it be other than the absolute total legend that is Harriet Harman? <laughs> Harriet, hello, how are you? Oh, I'm absolutely thrilled. I feel really so excited about this. You know, I was so thrilled when co- podcasts started doing politics, but then I started to get irritated by the kind of sameness of them all. So I was so excited when electoral dysfunction started up. So to find myself absolutely joining it, I feel I'm on the threshold of something absolutely amazing. And thank you so much for letting me join you and all the people who are part of the podcast community. It is such a joy to have you here. And in terms of the fact that we love the very, very many, 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 many men that do political podcasts, it is lovely to have one of the absolute ceiling smashers uh, of of women that have come through the House of Commons, the doyen of, of the Labour Party, the Athos and Aramis to uh, our D'Artagnan, uh, the Harpo <laughs> to our Groucho and our Chico, Harriet. Beth and I basically feel that within a couple of weeks you're going to be scolding us as if we're your naughty children. And that might be the, the persona that we adopt. But we, uh, we are so excited that you're joining us. Oh, I'm really so looking forward to it. And also to the live shows. I can't wait to get out there. I'm so excited that you're so excited because you have done basically pretty much every job going in politics from deputy prime minister to mother of the house of commons you've done it all and yet you come on our humble podcast and you're full of beans about it so that gives me a lot of joy but you know when you look back on your massively long career can you give me like one or two of your political highlights I think the first real political highlight was when after women really hardly being in the House of Commons at all from the 1950s through right to the end of the 1990s, there was like about 20 women out of 650 men. And it was really all men, you know, talking to men about men. And when there was 100 women elected after the Labour government won in 1997, that felt like a big big change socially, culturally, politically, economically. So that was one big highlight. And then another really big highlight for me was when the Equality Act was passed at the very last minute in 2010. And that was really, I think, really important. And now your latest highlight is hanging out with me and Ruth every week and all our lovely dysfunctioners uh, who tune in. But Harriet, you are also going to come on our tour with us. Our live shows are in September with guests and a chance for the audience to ask us anything they like. London is sold out. There's a few tickets as things stand in Glasgow on Thursday the 26th. We still have tickets in Salford on Monday the 16th and Liverpool on Sunday the 22nd. That's the start of the Labour conference in Liverpool and Jess Phillips is going to come and join us uh, on stage for that night. All the details are at aegpresents.co.uk. So do go along and get your tickets. We haven't got like a pre-sale list like Oasis. Ruth, you and I have been podding for a good few months now. Have you got any advice for Harriet? I mean, I'm hardly an old hand at this, but I guess what we want and what I think the audience wants is to find out how it really works. Because there's so many people at home that look at politics and politicians and wonder, how can you make such a crazy arse decision? Like, what are you doing? Uh, And actually explaining to people how things work and how it kind of happens behind the scenes maybe explains why you end up sometimes getting to these decisions Uh, and also I guess just not being too tribal I I think what what always works is being able to say 
actually on my own side, they should have done this a bit better or I'm a bit disappointed in that. Uh, as well as saying, do you know what? The other lads, that, that was that was quite good from them. We're, we're going to have to react to this. They've put us on the spot there. I mean, Harriet, you can let rip now. You've done it all. You've seen it all. You've done it for five decades. You've been in government. You've been in shadow cabinet. You've been the deputy leader of the Labour Party. So from our perspective and for our listeners, it's great because you can really lift the lid on things and explain things in a way that very few people can see it from your vantage point. But also you can just say what you think. I, I'm looking forward to it. It's like Harriet Uncut. It is true that I've seen it all and done it all, you know, from all different vantage points. But there's so many new things happening that... You know, that's what I'm so aware of all the time. There's new things happening. There's new people coming into the scene. There's new ways of doing things. So it's kind of a very exciting time. And I don't want to be weighed down by all the stuff that I know, although by goodness me, I do feel I do know a lot by now. So you want to have Harriet Harman <laughs> uncut. I kind of want to get you pished, Harriet, and I want to see Harriet Harman half cut and see what we can really get out of you. Like, I think we need a cocktail night, ladies. Glasgow's the night for that, I think. <laughs> You're on. You're absolutely on. Harriet Harman half cut. We could have a whole podcast spin out in a few months' time where we only record on Friday nights after three tequilas. Um, <laughs> we're going to take a quick break here and then we will come back and we'll dissect Starmer's first big speech as Prime Minister and we will tee up the next political term for you. Although, uh, they're so keen, these lot. They start Parliament the week before it comes back, really, and get us all going, get us all in Berlin. Anyway, back in a sec. Now we're back and I am actually recording this from Berlin because I am following the Prime Minister around as he meets the German Chancellor and President before heading to Paris. Now this trip is being billed as Starmer's reset with Europe. So how does it work then? You're One minute you're in the Rose Garden, the next you're on a plane and you're just flying to Berlin? I'll tell you how it worked this week, Ruth. How it worked was I was lying around on my sofa at home thinking, oh, another week of relaxation before I need to get back into the fray. Uh, and then word had reached me that there might be a speech in Downing Street. And then word reached me that there might be a trip to Berlin. And before I knew it, uh, my hair was cut uh, my makeup bag was back in my bag uh, and I was heading back into work in a brightly coloured suit, trying to get into my work trousers because, you know, I've lived it up a bit this summer, I'm not going to lie. Uh, so how it works is Starmer had this speech in the Rose Garden and then I had my little wheelie case and then went off to the airport, jumped on the Prime Minister's plane. Although I have to say, what was exciting about the plane this time was I hadn't been on this one, and it was the England team plane. And apparently the Prime Minister was sitting right at the front, and the chair he was sitting in was Gareth Southgate. Uh, and then we flew to Berlin, had a, a pretzel with the Prime Minister last night, and then we had a press conference. So presumably, as soon as you got the notification you were going to Germany and therefore it was all about the European issues, do you then have to do a deep dive into everything anybody's ever known about Europe so that you're match fit for when you get to the press conference? Yeah, you do. You do. It's like a revision cram. Yeah, you have to suddenly go back to... Uh, what did they say at the security stuff in Blenheim? And what did Macron say back then? And what did Rishi Sunak do when he came over to Berlin a few months ago? It's been quite an interesting couple of days because there was, let's start with the fix in the foundation speech. I mean, it was about kind of setting the scene for the next few months in government. And I have to say, it was a pretty bleak picture that he painted. I mean, he basically said... After 14 years of conservative rule, the country's broken, everything is rotten, I'm going to have to strip it all back. He used this analogy of redecorating a house. You don't just paper over the rot, you've got to strip the house back to fix it up. And then from then you rebuild and you redecorate and you improve. I felt a bit like this was a prime minister that had said, this is going to be a change election. And then the actual political messaging he gave to me was very much like 
prime minister's past have made time and again, which is it was the other lot's fault that we're in the state we're in. And now I'm going to have to kind of put it on them and, and give you some pain. It's kind of what Osborne did back in, in 2010 with, with austerity. And he basically said, it's going to be a painful budget. I'm going to have to raise taxes. And I have to say for a country that voted for change, it, it was pretty dispiriting in terms of you know what he said. I mean, Starmer would argue that he's levelling with the country and being honest, and that's the change that he thinks people need in politics. I mean, Ruth, what did what did you make of it all? So I've been on a bit of a roller coaster with this speech. I was looking at it going, you haven't got it. You haven't got the X factor. You are completely beatable. If I was one of the leadership candidates for the Tory party, I would be loving this because I can take chunks out of your majority. You're not going to connect with the public with this. And you're not doing light and shade. You are at most two notes, which is both sorrow and anger. You're not, you know, if, if not one note, you're not doing light and shade. There's loads of stuff in terms of the communication of it that I, I really thought, oh, you've had all summer to write this. This isn't great. And then when I say I went through a roller coaster, I was then during the course of the day, I heard like the radio news on my radio in the car. I then watched the TV news at like six and then 10. And it came across mm. really well. And the briefing had obviously been really well and very clearly done because everybody everywhere had the same briefing. And I thought, well, maybe I've got this wrong because it clips up pretty well and it came across pretty well. So I, I kind of doubted myself. And then I was reading the next day, the columnists and the sketch writers, they were writing it up and, and they were also saying he needed to do a bit light. This was really, really sort of dismal uh, in terms of the, the way it was. And, and um, I, I want to speak to you about it because you have watched lots of prime ministers do this. I want to know what it felt like when you were sitting there because I was just watching it going, he hasn't got this. And, and at some point, he's going to become a drag on the ticket. He is going to become, because Labour is such a strong brand. The brand Labour is immensely strong. And if he becomes a, a sea anchor, if he becomes a drag anchor on the party, it'd be really interesting to see how disciplined it is. I'm glad you asked me about that because I actually was sitting there and I... I understand because I've listened to the Labour message in time and again, and I've watched in minutiae every twist and turn of the narrative. There is a whole story about a decade of renewal, planning, great British energy, growing the economy. There's all these things in which he sort of has a mission for, for Britain. But the only thing I really heard in that speech was it's going to be painful, unpopular decisions, I'm raising your taxes. And then I went back to the election and thought, well, you were not straight with people about that, actually. You specifically said there were no plans to raise taxes. Uh, the cynics would say you're doing this after an election because you can now, you've got the big majority. And I think within the Labour plans, there probably is massive radicalism. But Instead, what I heard was a kind of version of austerity 2.0 and it's going to get worse. If you think that the anthem of 97 Labour was things can only get better, I walked out of that garden and onto camera saying, well, Keir Starmer's telling us things can only get worse. He had given one side of a an argument but had failed to really try and give some vision and hope. And actually, in the huddle that we did with him afterwards, yeah, he talked about that saying, you know, he absolutely wants to convey a message of hope too and that the country will improve, but he's got to do the hard work first. And I, I, I just don't feel that that is coming across. But, but what he didn't say was any of, and mm. then the good things are going to be mm. X, Y and Z. And where we're trying to get to is here. And this is what Britain's going to look like in five years time or in 10 years time yes. after our decade of renewal. And here are some of the things that we're going to put right. So whatever people think of Osborne and Cameron, at least when they said the, the, um, the stuff with austerity, they always said why they were doing it. So we are going to cut the deficit so we don't land our debts on our children. We are going to sort the finances so that we can move forward as a country. There was always that second half so there was always the, you know, there was always the the slap, then the tickle. You know what I mean? I mean, we just, I didn't get any of that for Starmer. Harriet, what did you think? Were we being a bit harsh? Well, it makes me feel a bit nervous hearing, hearing what Ruth has said. And it's certainly nerve wracking listening to the scenario that was being painted. But we've got to remember Keir Starmer's record has been an unpredicted, much more successful than people thought he would be. So his track mm. record is that he does things and everybody says, 
this is not the right thing to do. And then it works. So I'm going to cut him some slack and have some some confidence. I mean, I remember when Gordon Brown, when he was chancellor, he used to talk about prudence with a purpose. So that basically you'd be terribly mm. prudent with the public mm. finances, but here's the purpose. And what Keir Starmer is doing is doing more of the prudence at the moment rather than the purpose, because I think he's trying to make sure that people don't become over-optimistic about the speed of change that they'll see in their actual lives. Because I think he's he's paranoid about this problem that he talked about in his speech, which is that you have a failure to deliver as government, that builds resentment, you then do over-promising, you then continue to fail, and that brings more resentment, and that brings total disaffection. But I was wondering whether or not our new team of MPs, many of whom were elected for the first time in July, whether or not they were getting over anxious. And I've been quite surprised by how sanguine they are. They're like, well, this is what we said on the doorstep. We said things were going to be hard and it would take a while and we're going to take tough decisions to bring about stability. So they seem to think this is what they were expecting and that they think that their constituents were expecting. So certainly it's like on the other end of the spectrum from Rasmataz, but, you know, perhaps he's got it right. Let's see. It reminded me a little bit of Gordon Brown, but actually more of Theresa May, and particularly in the question and answer, because he didn't, for me, really answer very many of the questions that he was given, apart from the one about the security advisor, where he gave a very clear yes and then no, Mm. or no and then yes. But the thing that kind of got me was he was so disciplined on his phrasing. So he was asked about the small boats and he talks about um, in his speech about the vile gangs. We're going to go after the vile gangs. But he couldn't say anything. And he said it six, seven, eight times. And it became like almost a verbal tick. Couldn't say the word gangs without the word vile in front of it. He couldn't change it up to say something like traffickers. He couldn't, you know, there are ways in which you can talk about this sort of stuff and make it different. And that's the sort of thing that that roboticness was something that Theresa May had. And we used to try and get her off of it because she's a smart woman. But you can tell a story where you can tell it in, in, in human language. So you can say it in so many ways. And it was just like it was one note. And it probably writes up fine in the papers to say, we'll go after the vile gangs. But if this is going to be his communication style for the next five, ten years, I think it's going to get pretty old pretty quick. We've actually had a message about um, this speech from David. He says, I'm already getting irritated by Labour mentioning 14 years of Tory neglect at every turn. Keir needs to take a lead out of Kamala's book and focus positively on the future. That's Kamala Harris, as we all know, is uh, vying to be the next US president. We should ban the whinging on about 14 years. Harriet, do you sort of see that the public might tire of this kind of looking back in anger, if you like, and actually if Labour want to change it up, that actually they do want to turn the page on this and they want to hear positivity, not being told everything is shit all the time? Except the thing about Kamala Harris is she's hoping to take over from Joe Biden. So she's got a reason to talk about the future on the positive basis. And, you know, there is a fight for the narrative of history here, because the truth is that literally Keir Starmer did not have responsibility for everything before July the 4th. And the Conservatives did have responsibility for everything before July the 4th. So he has got to stop us becoming blamed by their failure. The difficulty is how you do that without actually annoying people and make it look as though you're not focusing on what you're doing now. Mm. You're only focusing on trying to get the message across. But he does have to do that. That is the bottom line. He, He must not be saddled with responsibility for failures that were genuinely not his responsibility. But he's got to find a way of communicating that in a way that doesn't make people's teeth go on edge, which it sounds like it's starting to already. But I still think he's got to be doing it. I mean, the Tories were helped in 2010 with the um, uh, the note about they've spent all the money. And that was a very easy sort of encapsulation of it. But they can't just leave it and let the Tories say everything that is a problem is our fault when it wasn't. 
No, Harry is right. So this is the danger time for the Tories. So that Labour needs to pin on us as much as they possibly can because the, the stuff about selling the gold, there is no money left. All of that happened in terms of putting Labour into this financially profligate, economically unsensible box, a danger to you. That all happened after the coalition came into power, after 2010. So this is the time mm. for Keir Starmer and Rachel Reeves and Yvette Cooper and David Lammy and everybody else to start looking to assure the fact that the Tories are unelectable for a second and a third term mm. of Labour mm. by pinning as much as they can. So they, they have to do that part. But in terms of if, if I was a Labour activist, my worry would be that they're already blurring the lines. For me, my takeaway from it was, number one, it's going to be a very bumpy few weeks and months for the Labour Party because having said in a general election there were no plans to raise taxes, it's now very clear that a number of taxes will be raised. They've already surprised uh, pensioners and not in a positive way by cutting uh, winter fuel payments. Once the Conservatives get their act together, they will be able to argue this is all what we warned you, it's the same old Labour, they don't tell you what they're going to do and then you, they hit you with taxes. And Starmer is trying to get on the front foot and build that narrative about I'm taking the difficult decisions now, but I think that he is going to have to show progress. And it might be incremental progress, but it has to show progress on on waiting lists or, or unlocking planning or there has to be a, a narrative a, along with all the bad news about how the country is beginning to change. And I think at the moment he still is benefiting from the benefit of the doubt. So we're here in Berlin. He comes and says, I want a better trade deal with Germany. I say to him, well, how are you going to do that if you don't rejoin the single market, the customs union or the European Union? And he says, well, we're doing the work and we'll make progress. And at the moment, they have that luxury of everyone has to give them the benefit of the doubt. But going into the autumn, I think the rubber will hit the road, right? And he's going to he's going to have some difficult decisions and become very unpopular i think if if things don't begin to improve so but the scene is set i think for a very difficult fiscally certainly a very difficult autumn for the labor party for sure just harry on that were you surprised about how he clear he was about tax rises i don't think they're going to break the promises they made in the manifesto so i think what they said about income tax what they said about national insurance vat i don't think I don't think they're going to break that in the budget. And I think that the Tories saying this is all softening everybody up for breaking the manifesto promises as soon as we get to the October budget, I just don't think that'll happen. I think they did always say there was going to be scope for generating more income. For example, the things they put in the manifesto to generate more income, like ending the exemption of VAT on private schools, like dealing with some of the... Uh, gas and electricity companies, dealing with non-DOMs. We've never said taxes won't need to come in in order to pay for the improvements we want to see in public services. There's been an emphasis on a fairer way of raising money and not hitting working people. So I think that they will stick with their election promises, but they will also at the same time be trying to raise income. I think one to look, thing to look out for is it, it might not matter that I didn't particularly think that Keir Starmer was, was very good in terms of the, the setting out thing this week, because he has proven time and time again that in terms of being a general, uh, sometimes it's better to be lucky than good, and he is a lucky general. So it might be that he is lucky in his opposition, in that the Tory party could easily completely self-immolate when it when everybody gets back uh, and the leadership election starts in earnest. If, however, the Tories hang together and they elect a sensible leader and is able to maintain party discipline to a degree, I absolutely think that Keir Starmer is there for the taking. Uh, his majority is massive. He's got Blair-like levels of majority, but he is not a Blair-like figure. And there is an absolute ability to land punches on him. And I think that if you start seeing at council elections and things like that, the Tories coming back and back. It would be interesting to see him under pressure because I don't think he's ever really been put under pressure. Um, and, and I think, you know, politics just got interesting again. Well, amen to that. I think that politics is about to get very interesting again because I think there will be running battles over tax rises, the Conservative leadership election, and he's got problems on his own back benches. People don't like the winter fuel allowance changes. They don't like the two-child benefit that he's not raising uh, the cap 
on that. And I think that there will be uh, many, many running battles uh, for Keir Starmer into the autumn. Uh, It's going to get very interesting indeed. But before we go, we have to plug our live shows for our amazing guests. We mentioned Jess in Liverpool. We have Kirsty Walk in Glasgow. and We have some other guests to tell you about very soon. Look at aegpresents.co. Dot UK And Patrick emailed us to say he's booked a ticket for Glasgow. He's actually asked a great question too. He says, when you visit Glasgow, are you letting a ginger gay 23-year-old take you out to polo? That's Glasgow's <laughs> gay club, apparently. I'm sure Ruth's been many a time. Ruth, are we going to polo? You want to go to the polo lounge, Beth? You would be yeah, beloved in the polo lounge. Yeah. Would I? I always want to be beloved. <laughs> like all the gays would be all around you. You'd be, you'd be like a beacon. They love you. Can we take Harriet. Will you come as well? Absolutely. Do you know, a strong woman with the smack of firm government about them. Harriet, you're in. But the whole point for us going on the road is we get out there and we experience these places like the Polo Lounge, which I've never heard of. But, you know, we've got to get out there and... Um, you know, get the vibe and bingle. No, I can't wait. Yeah. So Patrick, yeah, it appears that we are we are coming to the polo. So uh yeah, cool. Thanks for the invite. Well, remember, uh, you can email me whenever at electoraldysfunction at sky.uk or send a voice note to my burner phone on 07934 four. Don't forget to book your tickets. Harriet is here. And not only is she here permanently, she's also coming on tour and what goes on tour stays on tour ladies we're on we're on tour what's okay so we will all see you next week and harriet welcome so please thank you thank you yeah it's great to have you okay bye-bye. bye 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 bye